Uh, Bob Emmons is also from Uni University of California in Davis. Uh, he is in that great department there with 45 other workers. I understand it's, it must be a dynamic place to be, and along with Phil Shaver, who we heard earlier. Uh, Bob has written uh, another probably 150 articles. He's written numerous books, and one of them, which has really um, done well, is entitled Thanks, How Practicing Gratitude Can Make You Happier. And uh, he's also been the editor and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Positive Psychology. I heard of, I've heard about him a lot on the issue of, on, on, in the area of positive psychology. Please give a warm welcome to Bob as he comes forward to speak to us on gratitude, the linchpin between adversity and delight. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Why does it seem that every other person here is named John? Is that just me? I just, <laughs> just noticed that. Um, thank you. Um, there are a lot of points I want to make in about an hour's time, or a little less than an hour, try to save a few minutes for questions. So there's no clock here, so I'm going to take my watch off so I can keep an eye on the time. You know what it means, of course, when a professor puts his watch on the lectern? Absolutely nothing. That's right, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. In fact, I'll just move it over here so I'm not tempted to look at it. <laughs> okay, so uh, you have a handout. Now, I have to apologize. Um, the handout is reasonably accurate, but uh, it's probably three quarters or so, maybe 80% accurate. But I've made a few changes up till. Uh, this morning, so which is fine because I don't want you to have to bury your heads in the handout anyway. Uh, all the information that you'll need to know uh, is on the screen. If at some point some of the slides that are on the screen are not on your handout and you would like to get, get a copy of them, just email me and I'll be glad to shoot you a copy of the entire file electronically. It's the big key in the middle or is it the arrow key? The arrow key at the top, or the arrow key on the lower part. Up, okay. Just edit that part out of the out of the video. Okay, later. Okay. <laughs> Gratitude. It's been referred to as the greatest of the virtues, uh, the parent of all the virtues, the secret to life, the key that opens all doors. It's great things have been said about gratitude. Uh, over the years, in fact, over the centuries. But it's actually this person who said it the best. He's not actually that fat, it's just this widescreen s stretches everybody out. Uh, this is Ben Stein, as you might recognize. And because he has some knowledge about, about money and investments and so on, he said that people would often ask him, how do I get rich quick? You know. Uh, where do I put my money? And so he would have to give them advice. He would find that, and this would be his response. Oops. Uh-oh, I did the wrong thing. Help. Help. That's not what Ben Stein said. See, that's why you bring your own to these things. It's that guy right there. That one. Thank you. So this is what Ben Stein said. He said, I cannot tell you anything that in a few minutes will tell you how to be rich, but I can tell you how to feel rich, which is far better, let me tell you, firsthand than being rich. He says, be grateful. It's the only totally reliable get-rich-quick scheme. Uh, in fact, he says, it's even better than that because there's no taxes on <laughs> feeling grateful. Want to be rich? Well, feel rich. Feel grateful. Gratitude brings emotional prosperity, uh, if not financial prosperity. And that's been something I've been trying to explore over the last 10 or 12 years, what gratitude is. Uh, does it in fact do what the philosophers have said? Is it the parent of the virtues? Is it the key that opens all doors? Is it, as Albert Schweitzer said, uh, the secret to life? He says, Albert Schweitzer said that, if you discover this, you've discovered what it means to truly live, he said to be grateful. My research tells me that gratitude 
is pretty powerful. In fact, I'll, I'll state this at the beginning. This is my thesis that I'm willing to defend with some of the research studies that I've conducted along with some other people, other laboratories, that gratitude has a certain power to it. It has the power to heal, to energize, and to change lives. Now, I know that's a fairly significant uh, statement, and we hear that a lot of times, that this is going to change you. This will transform your life, right? You'll never be the same, uh, and so on. Is it true? Does gratitude deliver what it seems to promise? How would you actually go about uh, developing or designing a series of research studies, experiments or surveys of some sort or another to collect some data that would speak to this thesis that perhaps could shed some light, determine whether it is accurate or not, and if so, in what ways, and how is gratitude so powerful? Okay. It turns out that I think it's, it's got a big role to play in human health, human flourishing, happiness, subjective well-being. And that was my interest initially, how I got involved in this research. In graduate school, I was doing research in the psychology of happiness. But we didn't call it happiness in those days. You weren't allowed to use the H word. And this is the 1980s. It was seen as too, uh, kind of like spirituality uh, still, as you know, kind of esoteric, you know, not very, not very uh, scientific, right? Kind of hard to um, measure, hard, hard to quantify. So instead of calling it happiness, we called it subjective well-being. That's better, all right? That's more legitimate. You get research grants to study subjective well-being, but not to happiness. But now you can, now it's okay, because now you have a science of happiness. There's people out there that will tell you, based upon empirically validated interventions, uh, how to become happier in 30 days, three hours, 10 minutes, you know, one week, whatever. There's lots of programs out there to be happy, some of which are based on some science and others are not. Much of what the gratitude research shows, though, is that gratitude is one of these steps toward happiness. Let's talk a little bit, though, about what gratitude is. I find gratitude fascinating for many reasons, partly because there's so many different layers and levels to it. You can examine it from a lot of different perspectives. And uh, I'll try to give you a flavor of that in the next 45 minutes or so. On the one hand, gratitude is very much uh, a common idea. We know about gratitude, we experience gratitude, we receive expressions of gratitude, we do someone a favor and they say thank you, right? Someone does us a favor, we say thank you, we want to reciprocate that kindness at some point, which is also part of gratitude, not just the feeling, the expression, but then the desire to give back in some measure to which we've received and are still receiving. So that's a big part of uh, gratitude. So it's part of everyday interactions much of life is about giving, receiving, repaying benefits, and, and how do we sustain that? How do we keep a memory of the way we, ways in which we've been benefited by others unless we have something like gratitude, which helps us remember, but also helps us to pay back, to reciprocate. Uh, gratitude is also a spiritual concept. There's a, there's a transcendent notion to gratitude as well. So it's a very much at home in religious discourse, no matter what religious tradition. I'd, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a religious tradition that thought gratitude was unimportant or that um, advocated its practitioners to be ungrateful. Oh, we think gratitude is a bad thing. Let's go for ingratitude, you know, and develop a religion around that. I don't think it would succeed very well. I just don't think people would, uh, would uh, follow a tradition that uh, emphasized being ungrateful. So it makes it interesting at a, a more spiritual level I'll look at an example uh, shortly. What I'm going to talk about in the, in the talk today, the focus on three things. Number one, what, what is gratitude? We'll go over that fairly quickly. And then spend more of our time looking at what we know about gratitude, why gratitude matters, and also how to get more of it. And what are some of the practices? What are some of the uh, disciplines or exercises that people can engage in to create more gratitude for themselves in their lives and possibly thereby to experience some of the benefits that the grateful life can bring. There's, of course, great tradition in uh, world religions about the power, the nature of gratitude, thankfulness. This is a quote from uh, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. And Wesley, you know, this is in the 1700s, is asked, what is true religion really about? True religion, authentic faith. You know, and there's been debates for centuries about what, what is involved, what, what are the beliefs, you know, the doctrine and the dogma, what are there feelings involved, which, so which ones, is it love, is it humility, uh, and so on, is it good works, compassion, etc., etc., etc. And Wesley said it's two things, 
right tempers towards God and towards man. Right tempers, right feelings, right attitudes. It says it is in two words, gratitude and benevolence. Gratitude to our creator and supreme benefactor and benevolence to our fellow creatures. So he boiled it down to these two things, right, basically. And he believed that uh, benevolence issued out, benevolence toward others issued out of a sense of gratitude uh, for receiving gifts in the first place. And so, again, I could spend a lot of time just kind of tracing the concept of gratitude through various faith traditions. There's approximately 150 verses in the Hebrew Bible and New Testament about gratitude, thanks, thanksgiving, giving of thanks. Paul's, Paul in his letters in the New Testament uses the phrase give thanks 33 specific times, right? Reminding people of the need to give thanks. Now, why would it be in there so many times? Well, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the obstacles, one of which is that we tend to forget. And so when you talk about a, a topic like gratitude, a lot of times you're not presenting a, 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 a really new or novel idea. Some of the studies are new and novel, but the research, I think, represents truths that we already know, but we tend to forget about, right? Which is why we need to be reminded about the power of thankfulness, giving thanks. Why we have a holiday coming up next week, uh, fourth Thursday of every November, uh, the gratitude holiday. And other holidays as well, Veterans Day we just, uh, just experienced, Memorial Day, Mother's Day, I mean, all these holidays are really opportunities for, for gratitude. So that's kind of cool. All right. Gratitude, let's talk about what it is. Very briefly, again, don't want to get into too many different definitional issues here, but I like to think about it in terms of two stages of information processing. Number one, we affirm that there is goodness or good things in our lives. Gratitude is first and foremost about saying yes to life. Right? There's, there's good things in there. It doesn't mean that there's not bad things, that there's not losses, adversity, uh, and suffering. F far from it. In fact, I'll mention a little bit later, I think there's a strong connection between the two. But it's first of all saying, yes, there are good things in life, whether you want to call them benefits, gifts, graces, goodness, etc stuff that makes life worth living. Second stage, though, is that we look to see where those things came from. We see that the sources of these lie at least partially outside of ourselves, that we can't take full credit for them. We can't say, I did it all myself. Then we'd have pride, for example. We wouldn't have gratitude. So we attribute them to other people, to God, to uh, loved ones, to strangers, to people who came before us. Uh, uh, ancestors, people we don't know, strangers looking out for us, uh, protecting us, uh, and so on around the world. We look and we say, okay, we are grateful for everything that other people are doing uh, for us or having an, at least an impact upon us in our lives. So gratitude is interesting from the perspective of an emotion. Some emotions, are you can direct them inward. Obviously, pride is one. You get angry at things that you do, right? Uh, you feel guilty. That's self-directed, and so on. Uh, you would not say, I'm grateful to myself. Right, that would be kind of unusual to say that. You know, even if you bought yourself a present, let's say it's your birthday coming up, you're, not, you're, you're worried you're not going to get that item you really want. So you go to the store, go to the gallery here, and you buy it, and you wrap it up, and so on. And then on your birthday, you open it up. You say, well, look at that. You know, you're so surprised that you <laughs> gave yourself. You wouldn't say, I'm grateful. Right? And that's kind of silly to say you're grateful. You can't be grateful to yourself. Uh, now, you might disagree. That's fine. Uh, at a conference once, I mentioned that early on in the talk, and then a graduate student followed me around for the next four days, say, insisting, yes, you can be grateful to yourself, and trying to come up with all these examples, and I, I don't think he, he got it correct, but, but the, all the examples I, I came up with counterexamples. You're, you're not really talking about gratitude there. Um, so it's directed outward. It's not about the self, which makes it somewhat unusual or unnatural. If you take the perspective that thinking about oneself is very natural, it's very uh, normal, we care about our own well-being, uh, first and foremost, but gratitude, we're looking outward, directing our attention to the good things that other people are doing, uh, helping us out at some cost to themselves, oftentimes. Whoops, I guess I didn't have that slide in there, but I want to talk, uh, just mention that in terms of the recognition. So think of gratitude as very much a thoughtful state of mind. It's a feeling, certainly we feel grateful, but first we start with recognizing, becoming aware, acknowledging, Thinking, thanking, go together. Similar words, right? Come from the same root. Uh, recognizing, thinking again about why we have something or who helped provide that for us. Intentionally gave us a benefit. 
usually at some cost to themselves in terms of time, effort, other resources. We acknowledge that they've done something, they've gone out of their way to provide us with assistance. The appropriate response to that assistance is gratitude. Now, a few of you were here last night and I mentioned that gratitude is something that wasn't on the scientific radar screen until about, looks like about 10 years ago. This is a uh, chart showing the uh, evolution of research on gratitude based upon articles in the PsycInfo database. Right, so if you go back 20, a little over 20 years ago, virtually nothing was known about gratitude. Uh, in fact, even though we were studying happiness or subjective well-being, gratitude was largely the forgotten factor when it came to happiness. And then you see a little bit of increase here in the, in the 90s, but it wasn't sustained. It wasn't until a decade ago, 2003, that you start to see an increase in the number of articles, peer-reviewed research articles on gratitude through last year, uh, the most so far, and what the bar will look like this year, hopefully it'll continue to move in that upward direction. So we're learning more and more about gratitude compared to what uh, we didn't know about a decade ago, which was very little. It's no longer a forgotten factor. It's become much more prominent. It's, it's, it's achieving a, a place in psychology and social and personality psychology and positive psychology and also in the fields of health and medicine. I give a lot of talks to um, uh, uh, the health community, medical community, to religious organizations, virtually every group, schools, parents, people want to know about gratitude. What is it? How do I get more of it? Why does it matter? How can I get my kids to become more grateful? And so on. The parents don't often say, how can I become more grateful? How can I get my kid to become more grateful and appreciative? And so on. That's interesting. Anyway, so when I began this work, it's kind of uh, interesting. You have possibilities there. It's like, well, here's a whole big field. It's yet to be explored. Where do I start? What do I do? You know, it can be kind of overwhelming, but also exciting. So, all right, what's the role of gratitude in, in happiness, in uh, human flourishing? To use a broader term that's used nowadays. Can you actually cultivate gratitude? Can it be, can it be um, developed, increased? What can a person do to become more grateful, shall we say? Now, I was trained in the tradition of personality psychology. And personality psychology tells us that people don't change very much. They're pretty much who they are today is who they were yesterday, tomorrow, whether you're 8, 18, 48, or 88. You don't change them. You have these personality traits that are laid down early in life, and they become uh, crystallized as you get older, or I guess fossilized maybe is a better word, as you get, as you get much older, <laughs> they don't change very much uh, apart from some may maybe major trauma or really I think you know some sort of intensive psychotherapy or a, a, a powerful religious conversion. People just are pretty continuous over time. So can you really cultivate gratitude? We wanted to see if this was true and if so, even if you can't, we could also see what are the effects of gratitude on health, well-being, happiness, the sorts of things we're interested in and, and as psychologists, and my field is, is positive psychology now, and these are the sorts of outcomes that we are trying to study. So we conducted several experiments, starting out a decade ago and now replicated in laboratories and uh, around the world, somewhere between three and 4,000 individuals between the ages of eight and 80 have participated in randomized controlled trials where we ask people to go out and, and keep gratitude journals. Uh, basically, is how it works. We, and we use random assignment. So let's say half the people in the study are asked to write down five things today. Go home tonight, write down five benefits that you received today in your life, five things you're grateful for, five people to whom you're grateful. We vary the instructions a little bit, but the idea is to activate a gratitude consciousness. On a, on a regular basis. So we do this every day for many studies. We use three weeks as the uh, time frame, long enough to start seeing some change, but not so long the person gets tired and doesn't want to be in the study anymore because you have to deal with fatigue when you do those kind of repeated studies, repeated measures. And then we have a control group who do not keep a gratitude journal, but we ask them to write about the events of the day. Uh, in one study, we asked them to write down ways in which you believe you're better off than other people. We call this the social comparison uh, condition. So we, we vary the instructions, and while they're writing these journals, we're also asking them to rate their feelings during the day, 30 different mood terms we use. We ask uh, uh, health behaviors, things like exercise, uh, sleep, how much sleep did you get last night? Did you wake up, feel refreshed today? We ask about social behaviors, did you help someone else today? Uh, how close, connected did you feel? Did you feel lonely or isolated? So we have a nice sampling for that three-week period of their 
uh, their, feel, their moods, their feelings, the, how they, uh, the bodily uh, feelings in terms of tiredness and exercise and, and uh, symptom complaints and some, some of their social behaviors. So we can see at the end of that period if there's a difference between the groups depending on which condition they are in. Now, you might think that's kind of obvious, right? If you're writing down all the things that went well, you're gonna feel better than people who are complaining. That's another control condition. They write down hassles, write everything that went wrong today, you know? And uh, that's a different focus of attention. But there is that notion of personality. You know, we know that there's happy people, less happy people. In fact, there might be grateful people by nature and people who are less grateful. Can you really move them around by a little simple intervention of writing for five minutes a day? Well, in fact, you can. What we found and what these studies have shown is that there's four, cate four categories of benefits from keeping a gratitude journal. Physical, psychological, relational, and then spiritual. So psychologically, people report feeling more energetic, more, more alive, alert, awake, enthusiastic. Okay? Uh, fit in, these effects are anywhere between 12 to 33 percent, depending upon what outcome we're, we're measuring here. So, for example, on exercise, we found in one study that people who were, people who were writing gratitude journals exercised 33 percent more, spent 33 percent more time during a given week in exercise compared to, and I don't exercise at all, so I think that's a whopping difference, right, 33 percent. It's amazing you get that much. 15 percent more sleep. Uh, they, they slept on average about a half hour more per night than those who are not keeping gratitude. And this is all random assignment, so there's no difference pre-journaling. Uh, uh, it was all after the fact, uh, journaling effect. They became more helpful, more connected. They felt closer to others. People who knew them said that, you know, I don't know what you did with, with Oscar, but Oscar is a much nicer person to be around. He's taking out the trash. He's helping the kids with their homework. Uh, so they, it was something that went beyond people just saying they were becoming more helpful. It was actually manifested in their behavior. And then spiritual benefits. People reported when they were gratitude journaling, they became more loving, more giving, more forgiving, uh, and more humble uh, as well. So a wide range of benefits that seemed to persist, in fact, beyond the length of the study. So the study would go uh, two weeks, three weeks. One of ours went for 10 weeks. And then six months later, I would contact some of the people again and say, well, I contact all of them, only some of them wrote back, usually around two thirds or so, you could lose some through attrition. But roughly 50% of those who responded said they were still keeping a gratitude journal, even though they're no longer required to. So there was something self-sustaining about doing this. They saw it had benefits. They saw it was working for them. They continued to do so, uh, which was kind of uh, neat to see. Now, there's lots of spiritual effects uh, to gratitude as well. <coughs> I don't have time to go through this entire list, but people report feeling more supported, sustained by others. They feel more mature, uh, more grown up, in fact, at least amongst our college students. First studies we did were with college students uh, at Davis, and they said being grateful helps me feel more, more grown up, more mature. They get some insight into the nature of how much they depend upon the help of others. Uh, another effect. A dependency, but a healthy dependency. I realize I can't do it all alone. I'm not self-sufficient. I'm not totally self-reliant. I need the, the help of other individuals. Uh, and so many, many benefits to gratitude uh, journaling, what we're finding. Now, it's interesting, with respect to psychopathology and psychiatric disorders later on in life, studies have found that gratitude has a protective effect. This was a study uh, published about a decade ago out of University of Virginia, 2,600 male and female twins found that thankfulness and one, one measure of religiosity, social religiosity, which is basically church attendance, one of the best measures they, they found, measures uh, associates with all sorts of health outcomes, were associated with a lower lifetime risk for a variety of disorders, externalizing things like um, personality disorders, antisocial personality disorders, conduct disorders, as well as internalizing disorders, things like depression and anxiety and substance abuse. So people who were initially high in thankfulness were less at risk for developing these problems over the course of their lifetime, suggesting that it goes beyond happiness, feeling good. These are not bad things. I mean, you shouldn't underestimate those uh, in some of the social, pro-social behaviors, but also in terms of reducing lifetime risk for psychopathology. So I think a big part of why gratitude is beneficial is that it can 
be a counter force against negativity. And I just want to read you an example here from a woman. She was a middle aged, she was going through a life crisis, and she was very depressed, in fact, suicidal, and it really shows the power of gratitude. She said, it was a few days ago, I was depressed and very distressed. I was feeling somewhat suicidal. Things looked pretty bad, and I wasn't sure what to do or where to go. I have felt this way on many occasions. I tried the crisis line on previous occasions. I tried the crisis line on previous occasions. I called again that evening. I was fortunate enough to talk with a psychiatric nurse. She was so very kind and helpful to me. She was understanding, caring, and supportive. Even her tone of voice was comforting. We talked for a bit, and she encouraged me to go home and call her back. I did that. I had started feeling less agitated and more hopeful. She said she wanted to call her. She said she wanted me to call her again in the morning unless I needed to call back again in the middle of the night. I felt so much better. I am so very grateful to her for helping save my life. I thank God for her. Okay. And then she was asked, because of this experience of gratitude, did you notice any change in yourself, in your outlook, attitude, behaviors? And she said, my experience was full of sadness and despair, but my hope was rekindled by the salt voice in the darkest of nights. She gave me dignity and showed compassion. The gratitude I feel toward her and the crisis line is immeasurable. I am better for it. I am alive, uh, she said. So, you know, sometimes people say, well, well, gratitude really is this kind of nice positive thinking and it's ignoring the negative, it's ignoring, it's ignoring um, suffering and adversity. Here we find that it helped her get through that time of adversity and suffering, that gratitude is an ally in our struggles with negativity. As such, gratitude also reduces stress. There's a number of studies showing that great, either grateful people, and there are grateful people, I'm not gonna put up the questions that we use to measure, but gratitude is a disposition also, and we have a questionnaire that measured reliably differences in more grateful versus less grateful individuals, that grateful people tend to cope better with stress. They're more resilient in the face of stress, particularly severe stress. Gratitude, when it's created through our interventions, such as journaling. By the way, journaling is just one of them. There's a number of interventions one could use. It just turns out to be the more widely used one. I think it's easier for most people to self-sustain and self-generate over time, but there are others as well. <coughs> Gratitude leads to higher levels of perceived social support. We know that's you know probably the crucial factor when it comes to coping with stress. Um, and when people, are, when we are grateful, we recognize the benefits other people are providing for us. It's a response to support and lower levels of depression over time. What else do we have here? And various therapeutic approaches have argued recently, coming from a more clinical perspective, is that, look, we need to take this into account. This information that every counselor needs to know, every therapist needs to know that gratitude can be a skill that can be learned, can be a set of abilities or a skill set that can be effective in dealing with some you know, major issues as well as some minor uh, everyday concerns as well. And all the, all the research se seems to point in that direction. How do you do that? How do you implement that within a uh, counseling a clinical setting is another story. But I have some suggestions. The last part of the talk will be all about the practices of gratitude. One study which uh, examined different types of prayer, the International Journal for the Psychology of Religion, examined, uh, they looked at prayer journals. People pray, and how do they pray? Do they pray petitionary prayer? Do they pray meditative prayer? Do they pray in um, ritualized prayer, book prayer, or prayers of gratitude, prayers of thanksgiving? This was looking at people with um, osteoarthritis, I think. Found that thanksgiving, or prayers of gratitude, were the most effective type of prayer in terms of its effects on outcomes, right? So that's quite uh, interesting. Now, just another way of, of examining gratitude empirically is by examining types of prayers. And it turns out prayers of thanksgiving gratitude are among the most common, uh, usually studies find they're the second most common type of prayer that people pray. Okay, let's look at now, the go back to the, the theme of the conference and the title of the talk, the linchpin. The, the, the kind of the, the point of um, connection or nexus between joy and suffering or delight and adversity. And there's two ways to examine this connection, I think. One way is to look at personal stories and anecdotes. And you hear people all the time talk about it. they've been through the worst thing in their life, and you know, but by golly, now they're, they're so overwhelmingly grateful. 
not because this thing happened, but because maybe they learned a strength, a skill, maybe they just provide them a new opportunity. Some of the themes were discussed earlier this morning, well, how this occurs, uh, growth in the face of trauma. And that's certainly one way to look at it. But empirically, there's been some studies as well, which kind of get at this in, in kind of an indirect way, but you put it all together, it start, starts to paint a nice picture of the role of gratitude as essential in the link between adversity and joy. And after all, what, what, the first Thanksgiving, I mean, that was joy in the context of the, the horrible winter that came before. Following suffering, you have joy. You, in the Christian tradition, you have joy the morning, Easter morning, following the suffering of Friday night. I mean, there's example after example you can document throughout uh, history of the redemptive nature of suffering, how it can be transformed to something through the process of gratitude. Empirically, though, you could design some studies where people write about unpleasant events from the perspective of grateful thinking or grateful reasoning or grateful processing. Uh, there are studies where people are asked to think about their own death. It's kind of a pleasant topic, right? And so on. And how does that affect their gratitude? There's work on caregivers uh, of people with Alzheimer's, and they keep a gratitude journal. How does that affect them? And then what happens when we watch a sad movie? Tragedies, we're, we're, we're drawn to tragedies, right? Uh, in books as a genre and, and in movies and film. Uh, it turns out that you think these make people sad and depressed, right? But it also has a potential of increasing their gratitude. Let's go through each of these. Phil Watkins is a researcher at Eastern Washington University and one of, the, uh, my, one of my colleagues and some projects together on gratitude research. And he hypothesized that that gratitude works, gratitude is effective, partially because it helps people deal with un the unfinished business of emotional memories. Stuff that's happened in the past, maybe it was 30 years ago, maybe it was three days ago. Something's happened, there's a romantic relationship, there's a breakup, there's a betrayal, there's a loss in one of a number of domains. There's unfinished business, or what he calls open memories, right? The kind of stuff that keeps intruding into consciousness. So he developed a design where he had people come in the laboratory and then write about these open memories from one of three different perspectives. Okay, so they were randomly assigned to three different conditions. Okay. There was a uh, uh, emotional expression condition where they wrote about their feelings, thoughts and feelings about this event in this open memory. Uh, second condition, they took a grateful processing approach. And I'll show you on the next slide what that looks like, or you have it in your handout. And then a third was a control writing condition. They came in and they wrote about something very neutral and boring like the contents of their, of their apartment or their house. Uh, they wrote about the shoes in their closet and so on. Just so they were also writing, but it was nothing really emotionally salient. Okay. They then they took pretest measures uh, about the intensity of the memory, how intrusive that memory is, and then post-test as well, and then a one-week follow-up. Okay. So three different conditions randomly assigned. The grateful processing looked like this. I won't read all of that, but basically they tried to try to recast the memory using the language of gratitude. Okay, so it's a bad thing. Uh, it's probably not going to have any positive effects upon your life, but hey, let's, let's get some perspective on it. Let's look at it from the perspective of grateful processing. Well, are there some ways in which this event benefited you as a person? Okay. Are there some positive aspects of it, personal strengths that grew out of it? Uh, have you been able to develop any gratefulness or th anything about that made you thankful, uh, for example? How can you be thankful for the beneficial consequences that have resulted from this event? So that was the instruction given in the grateful processing condition. Okay. And so when he compared the three conditions, uh, first of all, open versus closed. Again, so here it's such that the higher you go, the green is coming, that would be gratitude, the gratitude condition. So gratitude processing compared to the control condition and then the emotion control, which is where they express their feelings about it, neither of those conditions were as effective as writing gratefully when it came to closing the memory. They got more closure out of it. They were able to process it more if they wrote about it from the grateful perspective. Okay. What else? Intrusiveness was the next measure. Uh, how does recalling this memory affect you now? How much emotional impact is there of the memory? Okay. Pre-test, there's no difference between the groups. They all uh, look the same, which is what you expect from a random assignment. But then post-test and then a week later, you see that those who process the event from a gratitude lens, uh, 
had a more positive impact of it. That's, this is less intrusiveness. Um, the higher the number, the more positive the impact, the memory, uh, compared to the control conditions down there and down here. And so the uh, effects lasted at least a week when they did the follow-up, suggesting that thinking gratefully about the memory has a way of reducing its negative impact, closing it, reducing it. It's not as intrusive. <coughs> this is the measure of intrusiveness, number of intrusive memories about the open. So now going down is good. In this case, the lower the number, uh, the fewer the intrusions. Now you see the graduate condition result in fewer intrusive memories. So grateful processing helped bring closure to this open memory. And so suggesting that's one way in which gratitude can be beneficial. What else do we have? There's a number of interesting experiments that are kind of similar. You either, you either induce gratitude by having people write gratefully, or you look at people who already differ in gratitude by a trait measure of gratefulness. And this shows that um, grateful individuals, so the, uh, the blue uh, lavender is high grateful, the darker purple is low grateful. Okay, this is positive memories, negative memories. Number of studies show that grateful people have a positive memory bias. You know, but with depression, right, there's a negative memory bias. Depressed people, they remember all these negative events from their lives, some which happened, some which didn't. They mag tend to magnify those. When you look moment to moment and then compare recollections, moment to moment, you don't see as big a difference, but recollection, they recall more negative memories. Well, with gratitude, it's just the opposite. Grateful people have a positive memory bias. They recall more positives than negatives. <coughs> they recall fewer negatives uh, than do people who are less grateful. So that's a bias that works in the opposite direction. Perhaps one of the reasons that sustains grateful thinking over time, you, the more prone to noticing goodness in the world, positivity, and then recalling more positive events from their lives. Let's see, you'll skip over that one. We skip over this one. There's just some studies showing that gratitude can reduce depression. Uh, at least mild cases of depression, grateful processing can be quite effective. So there's another finding that could be uh, of interest in integrating that within some psychotherapeutic protocols. Grateful processing can be quite effective. <coughs> okay, let me see here. Where we go now? We have about 20 minutes left or so. Thinking about death. This is, a, this is an interesting one. Death reflection enhances gratitude. So here's how not to be popular. You go to a, you're at a dinner party and there's a conversation lull. They say, hey, let's, let's talk about death right now. Do you ever think about, your, think about what it's like to die kind of deal? Well, psychologists like to do that sort of thing. And so they ask people to contemplate your own death. And that's what they did in this. They imagined a death uh, scenario and they had this... Um, uh, this scenario where you're in a building, the building is burning and there's smoke and before you know it, you're overcome by smoke and you die. And then they fill out all these questionnaires. You know, how do you feel right now? Well, you know, probably not too good. And so on, and all these questions. And, but what's interesting is that they don't feel too good, but they feel more grateful about their lives afterward. This is changes in gratitude as a function of death reflection. There's another manipulation they use called a mortality salience where you're not in a particular situation like a burning building, you just kind of think more abstractly about your death. And the death reflection, in fact, had the biggest impact, change in gratitude, more gratitude when they contemplated dying, which is quite interesting and gives rise to one of my suggestions about how to gratitude more effectively for, for journal more effectively for gratitude is by thinking about something that's about to end, whether it's your own life or some positive experience, a relationship, a job where you're living, Think about it that it's, that, it's, that it's precious, that it's scarce. You, you rely upon the principle of scarcity, that something positive is about to end. You elevate its, its level of, of meaningfulness. You appreciate it more. You enhance your gratitude that way. Perhaps that's what's happening with respect to this experiment. There's some studies on caregiving. People who give care to uh, spouses with Alzheimer's. This poor man here, his wife had Alzheimer's for nearly three decades. And, Basically, you know, took care of her from, you know, all, all day, all night, quit his job, and it's a tremendous love for her, even though she no, no, no longer realized who he was after a while. And, and Joanne Sang, who's at, up, up at Baylor University, she's been doing research with caregivers who keep gratitude journals as a way of perhaps dealing with some of the stress of uh, providing care to a loved one with Alzheimer's. 
So she did an experiment where half the caregivers kept daily gratitude journals and, and half did not okay, for two weeks. And she found an effect. Those who kept a gratitude journal okay, had experienced less stress, less depression, an increase in well-being, increase in optimism, greater self-esteem, okay, fewer physical health complaints from keeping a gratitude journal. Even if they wrote about very, what seemed to be, I mean, not particularly uplifting or positive things in the gratitude journal, but here's, a, here's an example. One woman wrote, I was very grateful that Bill called me by my name. He did not want me to go and asked me to come back. On another day, the entry in her journal read, I was grateful today because Bill remembered it was July, not January. I mean, little, little thing, little, little victories like that was enough uh, to seemingly, when they started to pay attention to these and, and, and monitor them and write them down, got some boost, uh, even in the context of caring for uh, a loved one with uh, Alzheimer's. Okay, well, some more il illustrations. It's just lots of examples. It's hard to bring them all. Uh, in, a, in a short talk, but all of which are pointing to the role that gratitude can play in dealing with adversity and suffering and loss. Tim, Tim Van Dyvendijk is the Vice President of Spiritual Care at Memorial Hermann, which I think is not too far from here, right? And last time I was in Houston, uh, I was a speaker at, at his conference, and he had just written his book, The Unwanted Gift of Grief, which sounds a little paradoxical there, but one of his, 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 his thesis in this book is that it's really about gratitude. When we express grief for our loved one, we're really expressing our gratitude toward them, that, that gratitude brings healing. Uh, I think I had a quote. He's here? Where is he? Wow, okay. Well, I better not be careful what I say. Um, get it right. Well, he won't mind this. But wait, we're not supposed to show books. So, somebody else's book, okay. All right, well, this is a great book that I recommend because he said, look, we, we grieve because we've had a relationship with them. Gratitude is part of the healing process uh, and so forth. He's not saying we're grateful for the loss. We're not grateful for the grief, but we're grateful for that person and that helps the, the healing process, right? Um, he says, this is, this is part of it. This is part of the experience. We are expressing gratitude for this person. Or, you know, another uh, great example is in one of my favorite movies, Shadowlands, right? When C.S. Lewis, or in the movie version, Anthony Hopkins, which I, I can never think of C.S. Lewis apart from Anthony Hopkins, and when I see, when I see pictures of the real C.S. Lewis, I think, that's not him, that's not Anthony Hopkins. But anyway, of course, you know, if you know the story, you know Joy, his wife, is dying of cancer, right? And uh, he's been keeping his emotions, you know, controlled for, for all these decades. And finally, because of the love, now he, he, he's, just, he's just fully emotive, right? And she wants to talk about her illness and that she's going to die. And he doesn't want to talk about it. And she says, we can't have the happiness of yesterday without the pain of today. Right? That's the famous line from the movie. You know, the, the two are, are together. It's, it's a deal. They go with each other and so on. That's the deal. And then when, when she dies toward the end of the film, he says, you know, why, why bother loving if love hurts so much? Losing hurts so much. He says, I have no answers anymore. Only the life I have lived. The pain now is part of the happiness then, right? That's the deal. They go together. Well, I think this is what Tim is saying here. We're saying now, the gratitude now is, is part of the grief now, right? The gratitude for what was before, but also now that we have in our memory of this person. So again, adversity, joy, adversity, suffering, gratitude, uh, grieving, they all go together. You, you can't separate them. You can, but they, they connect in our experience. Okay, I don't know if I want to get into this. There's another study where people like sad movies. They did this, this study where people watched uh, a scene from Atonement, you know, and I don't know if you saw the movie or not, but uh, Kira Knightley's in it, uh, and so on. And there's a teenage girl who accuses her sister's love of a, of a rape he did not commit, and that changes the lives of everybody. It's like one you know, bad thing happens after another. And so when people were exposed to this film, what happened was that they became more grateful about their own lives in response to the tragedy. They said things like, you know, it made me appreciate more what I have in life. It makes me realize how blessed I am to have a life that is going great, not to take life for granted, and so forth. And so it's not just exposure to the positive, which increases gratitude, or memory of the positive, it's also exposure to, to tragedy, which can seemingly paradoxically, but maybe not if we think about it at, at another level, makes a good deal of sense how gratitude follows from contrast with adversity. Okay, 
Now I'm going to talk about, so you'll skip that, skip that a little bit about psychotherapy. This is good because there's lots of obstacles. Time to stand up and stretch. Talk quietly amongst yourselves. <laughs> Thank you. Good. So if gratitude is so good, why don't more people practice it? Right. Most people say that, you know, on our questionnaire, they say they're grateful. But if you look, you know, moment to moment uh, in people's lives, it seems like Thank you. It seems like complaint, negativity, resentment uh, is at least as high as gratitude, if not higher. Uh, so there's lots of obstacles to gratitude. And if we don't acknowledge these, we're only telling half the story. Because you can't just journal for gratitude and just try to fan the flame of, of positivity without dealing with the negativity. I really think that. There's obstacles there. There's the negativity bias that our, our brains are just programmed to look for the negative. Uh, you know, and they're... Um, Rick Hansen, who's kind of, he popularized neuroscience research, uh, a friend of mine, he's got this good metaphor. He says, our, our minds are Velcro for the negative and Teflon for the positive. So stick all the negatives of sticks. You know, all the bad evaluations and, and criticism people have of us, we remember those, but all the good things people say about us, we easily forget. They slide right off. Entitlements. Hey, I got nothing to be grateful for because I've earned this. I deserve it, right? I'm owed this. In an entitlement-based society, why be grateful? It's not a gift. It's not a free gift. I, I have a right to this. I demand this, right? It's this sense of deservingness or entitlement, resentment that results when we don't get that what we want. Uh, it stands in the way of gratitude. There's an inability to accept that some people don't feel worthy of getting goodness from others or kindness. Uh, and that, that gets in the way of their gratitude. Conflicting emotions when a given person has both harmed you but also helped you. So you have, you have this conflict, uh, and there's a you know, balance there. How do you sort through that? And then there's real suffering, that some people just aren't able to develop any gratitude because they've just suffered so much. And it's, uh, the, the suffering is not a good soil for, for germinate, uh, to germinate a seed of gratitude in their lives. But again, there are others who just go the opposite. The suffering magnifies their gratitude. But for many people, they have these uh, issues or roadblocks or obstacles that have to be identified, worked through, before one can reap the benefits of gratitude. Let me suggest, suggest a few techniques in the last 10 minutes or so that I have. One is a um, form of psychotherapy that doesn't get much use or much attention, at least there's not many studies on it. You can't find a whole lot of research on what's known as Nikon therapy. I don't know if some of you are familiar with it or not. This one's not in the slides, by the way, so you can flip through them, but you won't find it, so I apologize. But I wanted to add it because I think it's important because I think it's a, a very good way uh, a very concrete, very practical way of uh, identifying sources to whom one is grateful, and that's the idea of it. So Nikon was um, developed and brought to this country by Yoshimoto Ishin, who was a Shin Buddhist, um, brought it to San Francisco, this form from Japan. It's a Japanese-based uh, self-reflective uh, psychotherapy, which focuses on the word Nikon means looking inside, so looking within oneself. You ask yourself three questions. The first question is, what have I received from, and then you do that with respect to a particular person or relationship in your life. And in, in, in the Japanese form of this therapy, they always start with the mom, the mother. So you sit down and you do this over the course of a weekend, it's an intensive retreat. You say, okay, what are the various things I receive from my mother? And you go back as far in life as you can remember. Okay, so uh, when I was little, my mom changed, you know, and, and they say, you get real specific, not just, you know, she gave me some comfort or assurance or gave me a ride to school or whatever. You gotta say exactly what she provided for you, specifically, concretely, detailed. Okay, so I said that and I thought about it, and I figured it out, and so she changed like 4,375 diapers of mine, approximately. I mean, maybe off by a few hundred. But, so that's, that's what they want you to do, okay? So you come up with a list of everything someone's done for you, that's question number one. Number two is what have I done for them? What have I given to them? Benefits I've given to that person, right? And over a given period of time, each relationship, it takes some time to do this. 
kind of laying out there all, all your debts to people and all the credits you've received. That's kind of what it is. He was a business person. He thought in terms of credits and, and debits and so on. And then the third question, you ask yourself now, what kind of grief have I caused this person? What troubles, what difficulty have I caused this person? Okay, and that's the third thing. So it's what have, how have I benefited, how have I given back, and then how have I inconvenienced this person? And you might think, well, there's a fourth question, right? How has this person inconvenienced me? And they say, well, no, we're already pretty good at that one. We don't need to practice that one, because that's, that's what we do all the time anyway by default. Right? So, so forget that one. Focus on these three, you generate a little bit of guilt perhaps, but a good guilt, a, a, a pot motivating guilt. And what you realize, usually, is that you've been benefited much more than you've benefited the other person. You owe them, there's an imbalance there. Uh, but a positive imbalance, positive indebtedness, which is what gratitude is. Indebtedness you know, doesn't sound good and we don't like it, but with the gratitude there's a positive indebtedness that we want to give back in some measure towards which we've received. So this is Nikon therapy, and they show that it's a good way of looking at life accurately and truthfully and factually, and, and it kind of helps us get through these global impressions we have of this person who did this to us or didn't do that. Maybe they did these bad things to us. Yeah, but look at all the good things under number one they did as well. And so it's quite interesting, but yet it hasn't been, I think, fully um, exploited yet in terms of psychotherapy, certainly in terms of gratitude. What else? So basically, when, when one trains for gratitude, there's three steps, very easy, very simple. You identify non-grateful thinking thinking like, I deserve this, I'm entitled to this, I don't have time for gratitude. You think I should be grateful? Here's all the reasons why I shouldn't be. And you can come up with a long list of reasons why not to be grateful. These are all non-grateful supporting thoughts, or non, uh, type of non-gratitude thinking. What are, what are gratitude supportive thoughts? Well, we find that our grateful people have a certain way of speaking. They engage in the discourse of thankfulness. They use words like, I'm, I'm fortunate, I'm lucky, I'm graced. I ben I'm benefited. You know, it's a very totally different uh, language compared to those who focus more on deprivation, disappointment, discontent, dysfunction, uh, and so on. I think that's a big part of it. And then you substitute the grateful thoughts for the ungrateful ones and uh, push them out through this process, which sounds simple, but we can complicate it. Uh, we can look at it in terms of, not too complicated, uh, gratitude training involving the mind and the body. And gratitude is, is great because it does involve the whole person. It's not just a part of the person, but it's, it's the entire individual in his or her social context. So I like to think of gratitude training, and we can split it into different components here. We have self-guided gratitude exercises, and those are all the journaling, different instructions for journaling, some of which I told you about. Okay. There is another technique known as the daily gratitude inventory. Uh, where on a daily basis you make a list of things you normally take for granted. Maybe that could be in a journal also, you know, there's overlap between these. One can think about, the, think about the absence of something positive from your life. Think about a person, relationship, gift, something that you have that's a benefit. Now imagine your life if you didn't have that anymore, okay? That's what's known as the George Bailey effect. You know, what would life be like uh, in Bedford Falls, right? George, if he never existed as the angel showed him and It's a Wonderful Life, which has already been showing, right, for the holidays. I think it started around Halloween or so, so <laughs> it'll be on a few more times before Christmas. Don't worry if you didn't catch it yet. And then here's Nikon therapy, where you can do it. You can do it each day, you know. Uh, I did that once. It was kind of cool. When I was traveling on one of these uh, trips and got to where I was going, my destination, I thought about all the people who were responsible for helping me get from point A to point B, and it was like, you know, dozens and dozens. Those were just people that I saw, let alone all the ones behind the scenes, uh, who are helping us on a daily basis. That's another type of uh, training the mind to think in a, a sense of people giving you benefits and then what did you do to give back to them? Okay, what else do we have? Uh, I think in terms of a chart, <coughs> we can think about gratitude training almost as a form of mindfulness training if you want to think about it that way. I'm not sure if I, I use the same language. I haven't quite sorted out all the, all the nuances too about attachment, non-attachment, non-judgmental. Uh, whether this goes or not with it, I don't know, because part of being grateful is making a judgment. A judgment that something good has happened, and a judgment that other people are responsible for that goodness. So I don't know if you get into non-judgmentalism, and uh, if that interferes with gratitude or not. Uh, maybe you can enlighten me about that one. But I do think that there are some habits and patterns that have to be broken, and that's all those obstacles, the negativity, the uh, resentments and entitlements and so on. And how do you disengage from those? 
to be able to become, take control of your emotional life by seeing it as a gift, as a benefit, and not necessarily uh, as a curse. Focus on gratitude, supportive thoughts. We find the grateful people tend to be very humble. They tend, you have to be, to have a sense of accepting a gift from someone. Uh, and then you, you get to the stage where you're actually giving back. It's not just the feeling, but it, the emotion is not complete until it's, it's expressed. There's an action tendency that goes along with it. That's the giving back of the goodness through generosity, through compassion, through various acts, uh, charitable acts, which we find a lot of times are motivated by a deep sense of gratefulness. What else do we have here? This is a good one. Remember the bad is a set of instructions that can be effective in, in, I think, in transforming that adversity into something beneficial. In this case, it's gratefulness. And so the instructions say, think about the worst things that happen in your life, losses, disappointments, the worst day of your life, uh, the trauma, but then here you are today, and now you've gotten past that, okay? You survived it, you made your way out of the dark. Remember the bad things, see where you are now. So now you have a contrast, uh, the, the psychologists call this counterfactual thinking. You see where you are now and how things used to be or how things could be much worse than they actually are right now. Okay? Or perhaps they are still bad, but they could be a lot worse than they are. Or compare yourself to other people. It's, it's a contrast type of thinking, which can be another way to generate uh, a sense of gratefulness, despite what is going on in the person's life. Okay, well, uh, I have a little system I put together of seven practices based on seven different journaling instructions that you could do on a uh, weekly basis. In fact, I have a 21-day program that uh, takes seven different sets of instructions and you go through the sequence, the cycle, three times, each of them three times over seven days. So from, and if you want, I, I'll send you the handbook that we use for this. You start with writing down three blessings of the day. The next one is you focus on people you're grateful to, all the way down to the day seven, which is remembering the bad going from bad to good. And then you do this, let's say, Sunday to Saturday. And then the following Sunday, you start again with the three blessings. You go through it again. It's three weeks, because that's what we found it seems to work well in our studies. People start to show measurable changes in their lives, emotional lives, uh, in their relationships after this three-week period. It doesn't mean we're turning them into grateful people. You know, I, I have no illusion that we're moving them, you know, we're developing a, a grateful character here. But at least I think it's a nudge in that right direction if that's the direction in which they wish to move and, and most people do because they see the benefits of a grateful way of life. That's just a little matrix showing that <coughs> each day over a seven day period, this particular chart goes from Wednesday to Tuesday. Uh, there's the seven and then it's a, just repeated over a three week period. It's a good system. I, I, used, I taught a class at a big church in Sacramento where people were, were doing the system and they reported that there were benefits. And one of the nice things about it is that you pick what works for you. And then you learn at the end of a week or three weeks, you've done each of these three times, say, hey, you know, uh, the George Bailey effect, think about the absence of the positive, that's not doing it for me. But when I write a gratitude letter to someone, I stop and I write down a letter of thanks to someone who I never properly took the time to thank, and I send that to that person, or I visit with them, or I email it to them, that had a big effect on me. And you know, the next person, it's, it's number two. So one size does not fit all, but there are enough practices to go around. And look, I'm sure there's more than these. This is just what I've studied so far. There's, there's data, there's empirical based evidence showing that each of these are effective. But we're going to learn more and more as more and more studies are done in the science of gratitude. You know, before I go on to this one, I think that gratitude is a choice. People say, you know, are you born grateful? Can you train yourself to be grateful? Or, uh, if I'm born pessimistic, you know, kind of on the negative side of a, a minus 10 to a plus 10 uh, happiness scale, is there any chance to become more grateful? And uh, I think we can do certain things to move us in the direction of more gratitude, such as becoming more conscious, more aware. And I know that myself. Some, uh, John said this morning, uh, you have to be what you are. How did you phrase that? To, to tell people to do what you're doing, to, to, to teach people, you have to be, have that already, right? Kind of deal. Okay, well, here's self-disclosure. I'm not always the most grateful person. In fact, my wife says, how are you supposed to be this big expert on gratitude? You're like the least grateful person I know, <laughs> you know? So, I tell her, you don't know enough people, because I know people who are far less grateful than I am. <laughs> but you know, there's a reason why psychologists study what they do. We want to get better at it, right? 
I know people who are very vengeful and they study forgiveness, and there's people who are forgetful, they study memory. And there's people who are shy and they study, you know, assertiveness. It, you know, it goes on and on. We're trying to improve ourselves as a journey we're on, and so it is with me with gratitude. So, um, you know, it's a problem when you study like a virtue like this. You realize how short you come up. Uh, you know, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of tough. But there's a lot of pressure on you, right, because people are watching. You know, your family, other people. Is he grateful? You know, is he happy? You know, uh, are, the, are, the, are the happiness people the happiest? You know, and so it's, it's tough, right? <laughs> it's, like being a, it's like being a pastor. You know, you, you got to watch out because people are looking for you to slip up, you know, and say the wrong thing or make the wrong comment or whatever. So it, it's tough. What's the point of that? Oh, yeah, it's a choice. So <laughs> I want to quote one of my favorite writers is the uh, devotional writer, Henry Nguyen, right? And, you know, just great things he said about gratitude, more so than uh, I think of any other writer I've, I've come in contact with. And this is what he said. He said, gratitude as a discipline involves a conscious choice. I can choose to be grateful even when my emotions and feelings are still steeped in hurt and resentment. It is amazing how many occasions present themselves in which I can choose gratitude instead of a complaint. The choice for gratitude rarely comes without some real effort. But each time I make it, the next choice is a little easier, a little freer, a little, lo a little less self-conscious. It doesn't come easy, but each time he does it, it gets a little bit easier. Well, that's what this man did. This is a 49-year-old uh, um, uh, male, we've done some research with people with neuromuscular disease, so I was quite interested, John, when you mentioned you were a survivor of polio. Some of the people we studied with neuromuscular disease were post-polio uh, individuals. This person had, though, an advanced form of ALS, and um, he's 49 years old, and he gets to the point in his life where the disease has drained most of the energy, most of the movement out of his body, and he's in bed. He calls his wife and his daughters over because he wants to tell them something, kind of like leave a, you know, a message to them because I think he suspects that the end is near. And this is what he says. He wants them to write this down. And he says, I believe that life is not always fair. It has certainly been true in my case. You think, oh, he's going to you know, start complaining about how bad his life has been. But he says instead, it's not fair that I should have wonderful, caring, supportive parents who raised me right and brothers and sisters that are there when I need them. It's not fair that I should be blessed with a beautiful, talented wife and together, we should have two equally beautiful, talented daughters who make us proud daily. No, he says, life is not fair. Why should I have had so many years of good health and energy and good friends to camp and backpack with through the years? ALS is a terrible disease, but it does not negate the rest of my life. Now, you can debate, you know, well, is that nurture or, you know, is it his nature, or, you know, heredity? But obviously, he made a choice, right, despite his situation, what his response was going to be. As did Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And, you know... How do you talk about suffering without, you know, talking about something like this, what happened in the concentration camps? And if you ever read his book, Letters from Prison, it's just saturated with gratefulness, with thankfulness. You know, it's just all the way through uh, his letters, right? And Bonhoeffer said this. He said, in ordinary life, we hardly realize that we receive a great deal more than we give and that it is only with the gratitude that life becomes rich. Thank you very much. Grateful for your presentation, but we have to load the computer for the next uh, presentation. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to come down here, and the people who want to ask him questions to have a little gathering right here. Sounds good. We'll have a 15-minute break before we do the next uh, we start. Ten, ten minutes. <laughs> we only have ten. Okay. Ten, uh, ten to fifteen minutes in the break. <laughs>